Hi, I'm Barry Trachtenberg with Methodist Debakey. It's a great pleasure for me today to introduce Dr. Jim Feng from uh, the University of Utah, the Chief of Cardiology, and uh, really a thought leader and uh, a major player in the field of heart failure, and uh, it's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you for, for being here and joining us. It's great to be here. So if you can tell me a little bit about how you got into the field of medicine and, and cardiology as well and, and uh, how, how that happened for you growing up. Sure. And, yeah. Well, uh, I actually went to Duke for uh, college and medical school. And uh, when I was at Duke um, and had already decided on medicine as a career, I, I was going to be a surgeon. Uh, and a lot of it was drawn by a guy by the name of David Sabiston, who is the chief of cardiac surgery and chief of surgery at Duke for many, many years. And it was a very common paradigm at the time for their surgeons to do one or two years of medicine. So I matched in medicine at Hopkins and was going to then come back to Duke to do surgery after one or two years of medicine at Hopkins. But at Hopkins, I fell into uh, a number of attending uh, medical people that were all cardiologists. And then I caught the bug. Yeah. So at Hopkins, uh, particularly in the late 80s, um, and early 90s was really a hotbed of cardiovascular medicine, academic medicine. And from there, I decided to um, do my cardiology fellowship at the Brigham. And I think there's a great benefit to moving around. As much as staying in one institution is, is secure, I think moving around gives you great perspective and you learn so much because medicine is uh, really so different in every place. You know, like Tip O'Neill said, right? right? All politics are local. All clinical medicine is local. So. Absolutely. And that's how I fell into it. Yeah. So heart failure now, of course, is an exciting field that lots of fellows are, are clamoring to get into heart failure programs and, and mechanical circuit support has definitely been a part of that. How, and when you were doing your cardiology and internal medicine, it was a much smaller field. Um, it, it, so tell me what drew you to the field of heart failure and how you chose that as a career and the changes you've seen. So I love that question. You know, certainly when I was an intern in 1988, there was no such thing as a heart failure specialist. Uh, it was just cardiology, frankly. The cath lab and EP were just starting to branch out. The way I got into this was my very first heart failure transplant conference, weekly conference at the Brigham. I, I had entered the Brigham Fellowship as one of the interventional fellows. Back in the day, we had 10 fellows per year, and four of us were pegged to do interventional cardiology. And I still love the cath lab, I'm still active in the cath lab, but I found in the cath lab, uh, particularly with coronary disease, debating whether or not we should use a 3.0 or 2.5 by 18 or 15 stent. I just did not find that very intellectually satisfying as much as I like the technical aspects. But when I did heart failure as a rotating general cardiology fellow, I really liked the idea of bringing the total patient in, into the picture here and not just the coronary angiogram. And the idea that we could have such an impact longitudinally in somebody's life and not just managing their acute issue, whether it was like NEP or interventional cardiology, really, really appealed to me. And at the time, it just so happened that as I started my fellowship, Lynn Stevenson was recruited from UCLA with her husband, Bill Stevenson, to the Brigham. And if you know Lynn, uh, she's intoxicating uh, in many ways. And you know, I really uh, learned to love the field, and there's no doubt that she uh, sparked that interest. But along the way, at the Brigham in particular, there are other, three other people that I would point to that were really fundamental in my development, being committed to academic cardiology. And those three people are Peter Gantz, who you probably know, uh, the son of Willie Gantz, uh, the inventor of the Swan Gantz catheter. Uh, Pat O'Gara, uh, former ACC president and the doctor's doctor's doctor. And Dan Simon, an interventional cardiologist who recruited me to leave the Brigham in 2006 to go to Case Western. And those four people really have had a massive impact on my uh, development and my career goals. Excellent. And, and you had the chance to work with uh, Eugene Brownwald when you were a fellow? Or? Yeah, so Dr. Brownwald is uh, an incredible person. Uh, he, at the time, was actually chair of medicine at two hospitals. He was chair of medicine at the Brigham and Women's Hospital and the Beth Israel. He decided that he had to let one of those go uh, and then was just chair of medicine um, at the Brigham and Women's Hospital. And he's also uh, had such an impact on everybody in cardiovascular medicine. Uh, 
he's an intellect that you'll, uh, that you'll find astounding, but perhaps one of the best things about Dr. Brownwald is he's very funny. He's got a really great sense of humor, and I think in medicine we frankly need more of that. And I think that's, what, that's one of the reasons that really makes him quite compelling, in addition to, of course, his legendary accomplishments. Yeah, absolutely. What, what do you th think is the most uh, important change in the heart failure um, that you've seen in your career, and, and what do you envision is on the horizon to be really a game changer in, in this field? Well, certainly during my career, the f probably singular uh, disruptive uh, innovation has been the left ventricosis device. People forget that the NIH put an RFA out in 1961 long, long time ago, and certainly here in Texas and here in Houston, Absolutely. that history is, is known to everybody. But as a practicing heart failure physician, there's no doubt that that technology has been the singular disruptive innovation that we had. And the paradigm shift that you didn't have to replace the heart, but you can assist the heart, I think is also a very fundamental issue here because I always tell the fellows that the most important letter in LVAD is the A. <laughs> it's an assist device. It's not meant to take over the entire function of the heart. And this melding of man and machine, I really think is the future. Um, this is why people like car racing. <laughs> the intersection, right, of machine and man is, uh, again, intoxicating and uh, fundamentally where I think we're headed. I think also because of the uh, nature of technologic improvements, uh, technology moves at a pace that's just much greater than biology. And, and not to say that um, biology and basic investigation into you know, pathophysiology and looking for new and novel targets aren't important and will continue to evolve. It's just the timeline for which that happens is um, soberingly slow. Yeah. For example, ARNIs, right? Angiotensin receptor, niprolysin inhibitors. Boy, we probably had, I can't remember if it's 15, arguably 20 years between, you know, the beta blocker thing and then the, uh, the ARNI thing. And so, you know, the timeline is just so extended. Yeah. I think that's a very important uh, issue as well. But another area I think that's really fascinating in heart failure is understanding that um, the conditions we treat are only um, relevant in the company that it keeps. And that means the people right. and the other organs, as we talked about today. Yeah. So. Absolutely. So uh, thinking about all the things that you do, and, you know, being chief, obviously lots of administrative work, just, um, rounds, teaching fellows, um, speaking in the national circuit. Is there a favorite thing that you wake up and, uh, you know, the, the, of all the things you do that you're most impassioned about that uh, of all the things. Uh, certainly, I'm sure it's not the administrative stuff. But. <laughs> you never know. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, it's actually just being a doctor. Yeah. The best part of my week is, is clinic or the cath lab, yeah. doing the things that you know we went into this for. Yeah. Um, I think most of us are physicians somewhere down deep, uh, and that's where we find the greatest comfort and the greatest joy. And in fact, I don't know many people who woke up one morning and say, I want to be an administrator. Right. right. <laughs> Most of us, you know, went to right. medical school because of the ability to, to help somebody. Yeah. And there's no better way uh, to do that than in the office or in the cath lab or uh, in the hospital. So. Yeah, absolutely. What advice would you give to fellows that uh, want to e either heart failure or even just general cardiology fellows on, um, in terms of... Uh, Looking at the modern medicine and, and what's required and, and uh, you know, the RVUs and academic uh, uh, the competitiveness and, and how, do you, uh, how do you advise the fellows that are in your system and that come to you from the Heart Fair Society in terms of career goals? And Great question. So my, uh, my, piece of, uh, my pieces of advice really are centered around two principles. You know, one is do what you love. I have spent a career trying to talk people out of doing interventional cardiology uh, because I think jobs are hard to find. But if you really love it, it doesn't yeah. matter. So do what you love and be able to identify that. And the second is work with people that you want to work with. So the, probably the most important thing about a job are the people you work with. And uh, forget salary, forget location, you know, forget the weather. 
who are you going to be spending your time with on a day-to-day -day basis? And that will determine whether or not your career is successful, and more importantly, if you're happy. So going to a famous place in a great city can be a miserable job if you don't like the people you're working yeah. with. Um, and then the last is something that uh, Lynn likes to say is to be a finisher. If you're going to start something, be accountable and finish it. So those are my three pieces of advice. Yeah, and I think that's a wonderful, very, very true uh, sage advice. And so thank you very much for, uh, for being here. It's a pleasure to talk to you and have you give grand rounds and to get the chat. And uh, it's always, always great to, uh, to see you. And thank you for being here. Well, it's been delightful coming to visit you here in Texas. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Jeff. Appreciate it. Yeah.